Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to IOM uh, Regional Office in Asia Pacific for our first webcast uh, to uh, celebrate and commemorate uh, the World International Day Against Trafficking. I'm joined by several experts from around uh, the region. Um, I'll introduce them as we start talking to them, and we're going to hear a bit about what's what's going on in, in, in trafficking, in anti-trafficking activities um, from IOM's offices and IOM special projects. Uh, around the region. We're lucky to have uh, such a high, high caliber people with us from, from Bangkok, from Indonesia, from Hong Kong, Cambodia, Timor Leste, um, and, and, and indeed Papua New Guinea. So I'll start with Tara Dermott, who works in the regional office here, like myself. Uh, I'm Joe Larry, by the way. I'm the uh, regional spokesperson and senior communications officer uh, in the regional office in, uh, for IOM Bangkok. Uh, Tara is a colleague of mine here, working on leading a project, an interesting project called IOMX, which uses celebrity, music, and media to try and drum up awareness uh, about trafficking. Tara, what have you been doing recently? Uh, thanks for the intro, Joe, and for organizing this uh, conversation today. So, as you mentioned, IOMX is the regional office's innovative campaign to promote safe migration and to encourage public action to stop exploitation and trafficking. Now, IOMX aims to move beyond simply raising awareness into actually affecting behavior change through applying a communication for development approach. So this means that we take an evidence-based participatory approach to uh, designing our materials um, so that they are most likely to achieve the actual impact that we desire. So we launched in early 2015, and since then, we have been prioritizing our campaign efforts on two industries. Uh, we have been looking to prevent the exploitation of men and boys in the fishing sector and also of women and girls in domestic work. Uh, so in 2015, we launched the I Care Do You campaign, where we tapped into our strong network of celebrities, musicians, and we produced video content that reached 60 million people. And I'm happy to say that in post-impact surveys, we found that of the viewers of the programs, of Thai viewers of the programs, more than half of them said that they would support ethical companies. Uh, so this is really great for the counter-trafficking community's ongoing efforts to uh, not only protect aspirant migrants before they leave, but to actually address you know, institutional problems within supply chains of seafood industry. So this is really great. Uh, with domestic work, earlier this year we launched the IOMX Happy Home campaign, uh, and this was around not only increasing the general public's understanding of domestic worker rights um, and, and trying to provide a platform for domestic workers to voice their priorities, uh, but to also encourage all employers and homeowners and neighbors to make sure that their homes are happy homes that they are supporting domestic workers to have one day a week, um, that they have regular wage contracts. Uh, and it's really important because global stats I think it's, um, show that a domestic worker. So this is really relevant to the world today. Um, yeah, and, and so IOMX, uh, we've been focusing on fishing and domestic work, but we're going to be expanding the work that we do to other sectors. So uh, I encourage everyone to visit IOMX.org, follow us online, uh, and stay tuned for more exciting work that's coming out. Thanks very much, Tara. Um, Elizabeth uh, in, um, in Dili, can you tell us about the work you've been doing in helping victims of trafficking, helping the police to be more sympathetic towards victims of trafficking? What, what are you doing in, in Dili to make that happen? Yeah, in Timor Leste, we are helping the not only police but uh, the immigration services here in Timor, like to explain to them what is uh, human trafficking is because this is uh, is very new, like uh, we mentioned in Timor. So we are helping them uh, to identify identification the case, and then um, police officer is uh, mostly here or work through intimidation and usually consider victim of trafficking as guilty. So also there is like, um, we are like giving the awareness of a uh, specific uh, they need for a victim of uh, trafficking in here. Like um, dealing with the person uh, who suffer from like 
physical and mental abuse in here. And also currently last week we are organizing like um, PSS training uh, with the uh, local uh, national NGO in here, like how to um, encourage the police, how to give them, uh, like how to deal with the uh, victim of trafficking here. That's great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, a, a few uh, audio challenges there, but I gather you, you're helping, you're using actors uh, to help to, uh, to, to help the police to understand what it's like to be a victim of trafficking and get the police to be more sympathetic, uh, which is an amazing approach. Um, Nurul, um, you are a, a well-known um, anti-trafficking activist and, and, and worker in Indonesia. You've moved recently to head up an IOM's office in, in Hong Kong. Can you put, um, put some numbers on this? How many people, uh, in your experience, are still in, in, in slavery, uh, in, in fishing vessels and in sex work and uh, other forms of exploitation uh, in this region? Well, it's difficult to come up with the real figure, but uh, you know, when I'm speaking about trafficking in, in Indonesia, particularly for the fishing industry, uh, there are estimates that around 200,000 Indonesian fishermen actually still in the water and exploited, you know, just in a like uh, trafficking situation. This uh, figure actually come up from our Indonesian government. They believe on this number and therefore they are actually approaching IOM on how we could actually intervene and help them. In addition, that we have already been assisted over, you know, 2,000 uh, foreign fishermen, particularly from Cambodia, Myanmar, and some number of Laos and Thai in uh, Indonesian water. So, uh, you know, we work closely with IOM Cambodia, with IOM Myanmar to assist with their uh, return. And by now they all already go back home. But, you know, we believe that there are still small scale of numbers uh, happening because uh, just recently the Indonesian government through the uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Marine Affairs and the uh, Fisheries and Marine Affairs, they have contacting us you know, small scale of number like 150 or 20 people, you know, stranded in Indonesian water again. And of course, they are actually also uh, being exploited in a fishing industry. So that's if it is talking about uh, fishermen, <clears throat> uh, you know, exploited in a fishing industry as a trafficking. But when we're speaking about trafficking in Indonesia, we, in addition of fishermen itself, foreign fishermen or Indonesian fishermen, we have also big numbers of uh, Indonesian migrant workers who are actually exploited outside Indonesia, working as domestic worker, working as a uh, you know, worker in a plant plantation, particularly palm oil plantations, construction worker, and also, you know, of course, including in some other sectors. And uh, locally itself, we have local domestic workers uh, being trafficked, you know, or also being exploited in, in uh, wind in Indonesia. That's the situation. We have also foreign <clears throat> women actually uh, uh, from Mo Moldova, Colombia, Uzbekistan uh, trafficked in a forced prostitution in a big cities of Indonesia, including Jakarta, as a you know prostitution. So this is, is a situation actually a quite complex. Trafficking in Indonesia is quite complex. And if you're asking me to come up with some how many estimate at the moment, it's difficult to be honest. Yeah. No, that's true. Of course, it's it's. A that's true, of course, it's, it's a, a very shady, shady industry, um, and, and it's, it's impossible to tell uh, you know, exactly the, the, the numbers. So we're talking, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people uh, work as modern day slaves uh, in this region. And somebody who actually has to deal with um, that, that, that problem when people get home is Brett Dixon, who works in our office uh, in, in Cambodia um, as, a, as a project assistant, a project manager there. Brett, you're seeing uh, these people when, when they get home, when they get back to Cambodia, when they've been rescued by IOM in Indonesia, they get back to, uh, to Cambodia. What sort of state are they in? And what are the long lasting scars that they would bear from the, the awful exploitation that they endure with working 24 hours a day with beatings and with, with violence and, 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 and little or no pay. What are you seeing? Thanks, Joe. Uh, yes, yeah, so last year, IOM um, in the region, uh, particular IOM Indonesia, IOM Cambodia, Myanmar worked together to assist thousands of uh, men stuck in the fishing industry. Uh, and during these uh, conditions, um, forced labour conditions, um, and this has been possible through our presence in the region, also our strong relationships with the government and 
the embassies who played a big role in uh, identifying and assisting with the voluntary return. So here in Cambodia, IOM plays a key role in uh, providing post-arrival immediate assistance. So this entails meeting the men at the airport, um, helping them through immigration. Um, we also work in their land borders as well to assist men and identify uh, men who have been in that condition and to provide the care they need. Um, the, we either, uh, acknowledge that there's a, a lot of health consequences of, uh, of trafficking. So um, medical care and psychological care is a key. Um, so we provide a lot of uh, medical uh, checkups um, and treatment. We also have psychologists on board um, to provide that care and counselling. Uh, many of the men are returning back uh, with um, behavioural issues such as uh, drug abuse um, that they've picked up on the boats, uh, heavy drinking. Um, it's a very highly violent uh, sector that they work in on fishing boats and they're subjected to uh, regular beatings, as you mentioned. Um, so this has a huge impact on their uh, psychological uh, well-being. Um, and this can inhibit um, finding secure work and meaningful employment um, if they're suffering from depression or a drug abuse. Um, so we work with a strong network of NGOs um, to provide reintegration support, which is really key to uh, their recovery, um, to providing support to their families um, and helping the families to support uh, those uh, loved ones that have uh, returned. Um, We've had some successes in um, in a few cases finding uh, uh, employment, working with local employers to um, develop apprenticeship programs to uh, help the men to develop skills and eventually open up their own businesses, um, such as uh, motorbike mechanics. That's great. So there, there can be some good news and there can be resolution for these people. But as you said, there are deep lasting, deep and lasting psychological scars. We're hearing that, that um, trafficking is, is exploitative and it's wrecking lives. Um, what's the experience in uh, Khalil in, in, in Papua New Guinea? Uh, what sort of work is IOM doing there? And, and what's the trafficking phenomena like um, in the country where you are, which not many people would know much about? Thanks, Joe. Um, good day, everybody uh, listening in. And uh, I, what I wanted to say in for trafficking within PNG, um, the phenomenon itself is uh, is very, very, very little awareness has been done um, within the country. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what trafficking is, um, and that's everything from um, both domestic to international trafficking. Uh, so IOM has been um, engaging uh, with the community and the government for the past six, uh, over six years, um, since 2010, um, to, to raise awareness um, and to also develop legislation to um, to combat the, the crime, um, one of the biggest, one of the most significant achievements within uh, the last um, six years has been the official recognition of trafficking as a crime within the country, um, which was um, developed in 2013 with um, by IOM in um, assisting the Department of Justice, and it's now um, criminalized uh, the act um, by. Um, with a charge of two, 20 years for adult trafficking and 25 years for uh, trafficking of minors. Um, so that, that has been a huge achievement for the country. And um, alongside that, IOM has also been involved in the technical, um, technical aspects of it. So helping the government to um, identify victims of trafficking. We're working with the police, we're working with immigration, we're working with um, uh, customs officials to uh, go through the process of doing a victim identification assessment. Um, and as well as bringing together both the um, the government side as well as the, uh, the civil society side to provide a holistic um, approach to protection for potential victims of trafficking. Um, within the country itself, um, domestic trafficking is a very, very big issue, uh, largely because it is embedded so much in culture and the lack of understanding um, does not bode well for this. Uh, many people say, well, we've been doing it for this amount of years and there's never been anything wrong. Why is it now domestic? Why is it now considered trafficking? So getting getting the understanding of what it is at a very, very local village level is is key to combating it. Um, the issue of um, forced marriage, um, of, of underage forced marriage and 
paying off of bride pricing is a very big factor within the country and it's something that needs to be addressed and this is what IOM is trying to do. Great, thanks. We're almost out of time. Um, it's, it's a really, very complex phenomenon, human trafficking, and it can touch all our lives. No one is immune um, from being duped into trafficking from, from the villages in, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea to the metropolises of, of Bangkok. I want to ask you all one last question, a quick answer, one word or one sentence. And I'll start with you, Khalil. I'll go back in reverse order. Um, Khalil, what is needed in one phrase to make an impact against human trafficking? Uh, I think we need to work on the demand side and curb it on the demand side. Okay, great. Uh, Brett, how about you? What do you think? Is one, one thing that we need to do, what society needs to do to curb human trafficking? I think we need to empower migrants to uh, make uh, proper decisions, um, to give them the information so they can migrate safely. Excellent, thanks. How about you, Nurul? What would be the one the one thing you would say on this um, anti-trafficking day uh, to try and curb trafficking? Okay, Nurul, can you say it again with your microphone on? Nurul, what's the one thing you would do to curb trafficking? Law enforcement is definitely important to combat trafficking in person, in addition of, of course, you know, uh, promoting safe migrations, preventing awareness tracings. But I think law enforcement is playing also very significant roles. Thank you. And back to you, Elizabeth, in, in Dili, what's the one thing that uh, should be done uh, to help counteract uh, modern day slavery? Uh, from me, it's like uh, it's because the trafficking is very new in Timor Leste in here. So it's like maybe give more education, not only for the uh, police officer and immigration services, but this uh, more education to young generation here in Timor, so they need to know what is uh, trafficking is really. Is. Thank you, Elizabeth. And finally, Tara, what do you say? The one thing that needs to be done by the world to help reduce or stop trafficking? We need a global movement. We need for every individual to understand how human trafficking is relevant to their lives and to act accordingly. Thank you all very much for, for, for joining. Uh, thanks for getting up, up your time to discuss this important subject. It's World Anti-Trafficking Day, the day uh, when people take action against human trafficking. Spread the message. Log on to www.iom.int. Find out more. Uh, talk about this subject. It's not going away. It's a huge phenomenon. Uh, thanks again for listening in. I'm Joe Lowry in the IOM Regional Office in, in Bangkok.